From the Bake Salmon Studios in downtown Bakersfield, this is Bake Live. Here's Stoned Philip. Good evening, and welcome to Bake Line. You know his name. Lauren Armstrong. You've heard his stories. Maybe it's macaroni and cheese. You've seen his confrontation with Chris Hansen countless times. Hey, sir. Hey, sir. Hey, sir. Hey, sir. Hey, sir. How are you? How are you? But tonight, Bake Salmon and the boys present what Wes Most refers to as a deep dive analysis into the Lauren Armstrong interview 12 years later. Using new information gathered over the last several years, let's take a closer look at a simpler time in October 2007 and rewind to the beginning. Here's Baked Salmon. Good evening. I'm Baked Salmon. Lorne Armstrong. Just who the hell is this guy? And why is there a whole lot of people talking about him on the internet? If you're watching, you probably know the answer to this question. Some of you, however, may only know that he was featured on To Catch a Predator. Based on the TCAP footage alone, Lorne can seem rather forgettable, especially when compared to the glorious appearances by the likes of John Kennelly. I just came to get something to eat. John. Anthony Palumbo. Well, you can put that in the fridge. Yeah, I'll put it in a little bit. All um, right. I'll relax. David Schumacher. Dustin McFetridge. I brought a razor. A razor. And what were you going to do with the razor? I thought she wanted to be shaved down there. And Rabbi David K. Oh, no. Come on, guy. You don't, don't, you don't want to. You don't want Walter Babst. Getting my ass kicked. Getting your ass kicked. Yeah. I knew it. I... Et cetera. Walk your day. You did. Where did you have to walk from? Oh, way, way, way. Wait, wait. Why don't you come on over here and have a seat on the stool for me? And I believe someone out there watching has no idea what a Lorne Armstrong is. So, bear with me as I give a brief rundown on Lorne Armstrong and the lesser-known details of the period of time leading up to his appearance on To Catch a Predator and his subsequent arrest. We begin a few months before his appearance on To Catch a Predator. Lorne Armstrong, 36, left some folks holding the bag in Maine, swindling a whole lot of money in a construction scam. He bought a white Dodge Ram with the loot and split for Nashville, Tennessee. Possessing no charisma and even less talent, Lorne believed that he would be a country music star in no time. Three weeks after arriving in Nashville, Lorne met his true love in a chat room online. Kayla was everything he wanted. 13 years old, vapid, blonde. She was also an adult posing as a 13-year-old, but Horny Lorny was too dense to realize it. After just two and a half hours of inane banter, Lorne decided to teach young Kayla about human anatomy. He stripped down to nothing but a ball cap, which he used to hide his bald spot. After a whirlwind five-day romance, Lorne confessed he was falling in love with Kayla, and who can blame him? She gave mostly monosyllabic responses to his perverted inquiries. She seemed much stupider than Lorne. And just look at these photos. As Lorne said, Sexy little thing by the pool. This is the Kayla that Lorne fell in love with. But Bake Salmon, those are not all the same girl. Correct, and that fact escaped Lorne's feeble mind. For the next month, Lorne put his best foot forward, which, for Lorne, meant finding and losing a few shitty jobs, singing and drinking at a karaoke bar with the belief that he would be discovered, and leaving his webcam on so his girlfriend could watch him sleeping on the floor of his unfinished apartment, all the while grooming a 13-year-old who didn't exist. Thanks to the efforts of some members of this community, we have volumes of additional information including the phone calls between Lorne and Kayla. You haven't even begun to understand what a joke Lorne is until you hear him sweet-talk young Kayla, 
a girl who sounded like this. Okay, how's Buddy? Buddy is good. September became October, and Lauren made plans to meet Kayla. She told him her parents would be gone for four days starting on the 18th of October. In Lauren's mind, this had to be fate. October 18th was also Lauren's 37th birthday. With barely two nickels to rub together, he somehow gathered enough money to buy a box of condoms, a $5 faux silver bracelet from Walmart, and enough gas to make the drive across state lines to see his precious princess. Disregarding all sorts of laws against child abduction and endangerment and interstate trafficking, the genius plan was for Lorne to bring Kayla back to his place to consummate the relationship. And this is where the analysis picks up the story. After driving for an hour from Nashville to Bowling Green, Kentucky, Lorne's white truck rattles up the drive. His life is moments away from a complete implosion. The demise of his earnest hopes and dreams is imminent. Everything he knew to be true will vanish in just under 15 minutes. And we will be there to see it. When we return, Lauren versus Hanson 12 years later. Creeper by the dozen. Oh, Lord. He's here! My mystery date! Mystery date! Are you ready for your mystery date? Don't be late, it would be great. Open the door for your mystery date. It's Mystery Date, the thrilling new Milton Bradley game of romance and mystery that's just for you. And you, and you, and you. Mystery Date, will you be ready for swimming? Or a dance? When you open the door, will your mystery date be a dream or a dud? Oh! Fun and surprises. That's mystery date. Remember, Milton Bradley makes the best games in the world. So, girls, open the door for your mystery date. Get mystery date. The last phone call with Kayla was 7.39 p.m. Lauren parks his truck at 8.35. You're only about an hour away from me. Hey, I'm glad you could come. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. How's your drive? This is not Kayla. After asking about the outfit she was going to wear dozens of times, she opens the door wearing something completely different. On top of that, weren't they supposed to be in a hurry to leave? So when you see me dive in, you're going to be all ready to come out, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 Terrible. Really? How come? Oh, she was all right. Oh. Lauren tries to make a joke about his drive. He didn't have a follow-up, so he lets the joke die. You think this is funny? Huh? You think this is fucking funny? Between his, hey girl, and now this bomb, so far Lorne is batting 0 for 2. <laughs> In a message on the Temple of Teacap, Bubba Zanetti talked about Lorne watching the fuel gauge the entire way, and I suppose that would have been enough to consider it a terrible drive. Well, look, we got these new chairs, you have to sit down. I have to sit down? Yeah, look. It's a massager oh chair. God, it vibrates when you press the buttons. The reclining chairs were new and a complete departure from the previous table and chair setup. It creates an interesting dynamic and puts the predators at a disadvantage in terms of a quick escape. I like this change. Look, oh my god. Yeah, flip the switches. Which one is it? Um, you can use either one of them. It tells you there's one for your butt, there's one for your lower back, and there's one for your upper back. I just felt my butt. I think. You can pretty much tell a difference when you press Holy, the button. Holy, yep, that's my butt. That feels butt. so good, right? <laughs> so, I thought you had blonde hair. I thought you had blonde hair. 
I always thought this was another throwaway line. Just something Lorne said in a sing-songy voice in another lame attempt to make conversation. It wasn't until I listened to the Tiffany call, Bud Light Polygraph, that the magnitude of this statement fully sunk in. What turned you on about Kayla? Her hair. What, a, like the, her blonde hair, you mean? Yeah. She was okay. like blonde. Okay. Lorne had dreamt about his golden-haired princess laying across his lap. He had fantasized about playing with her hair and had stared at her picture for over an hour, according to him. When he showed up at the house and Casey had brown hair, I truly believe it threw everything off and put Lorne in a fog. This would also make Lorne upset. Not only has Kayla dyed her hair, but she did it without consulting Lorne first. Lorne is the type of guy who wants to choose your nail polish color for you, so Kayla dyeing her hair on her own would have felt like a slap in the face. This is the closeness he craves and is always begging for from his catfish. It's no different than Ramona and her diaper, uh, Debbie with the issues and her father, Winnie farting in his face, etc. Do you like it? I dyed it by I think, myself. I think it's pretty. Thank you. It's very pretty. Where's oh the my pizza? God. I was waiting to eat because I thought you were bringing some. <laughs> I don't want to bring you any pizza. About the pizza, Sherry Twist says he's bringing pizza in the report, but Lorne does state he's not bringing any. If you don't get that job, you can't come see me. What? Well, I can, but I'll have to work at the work today, pay today place, and that doesn't pay very good at all. There won't be any pizza or bracelet or cam for you. So, what are you having to eat tomorrow night? I don't know. Pizza, I was thinking. Want a hot dog instead? <laughs> Lol. Well, weren't you going to bring me something? Well, yes, I was. And I did. Did you bring any condoms? Yes, I did. I want to just point out that there is a post in the temple from Joey that details the box of condoms the police will eventually be finding in Lauren's truck later on that evening. Trojan Pleasure Pack features an assortment of our most stimulating condoms to provide sensual excitement for both partners every time. The assortment includes four Trojan Twisted, four Trojan Her Pleasure Sensations, two Trojan Intense, and two Trojan Warming. As somebody who's seen the nude images of Lorne, I'm going to say that Trojan Twisted is probably the ones he should go with. Where are they? They're out in the truck. Well, what good are they going to do in the truck if we're in here? Well, yell at me, why don't you? <laughs> I haven't had a kiss yet. Oh, okay. Well, then what did you want to do? Well, I want to kiss first. And then what? Can I have a kiss first? Damn, Lorne is so thirsty. Keeps asking for that kiss. Needy much? Well, let's talk first. We just <laughs> <Okay>. got here. <laughs> Would you like me to go on the truck and get myself? No, it's all right. No? You don't want your thing right now? The present I gave you? Well, what is it? Well, I can't tell you. That wouldn't be much of a present if I told you. Lorne would later claim he was pressured to bring a gift to the Stinghouse, but per the chat log, he was clearly the first person to bring up the idea of gifting Kayla. By the way, I'm going to buy you a bracelet. Well, really? For real? I'll have a pair of your panties here with me, so I need to buy you a bracelet so you can have something from me. And I don't really think it's a good idea if I give you a pair of my boxers. To Whether it's Kayla and the $5 Walmart bracelet, or Tony and every drop of beer they drink, Lorne is an expert at spending money he can't afford to spend. So the present is what, exactly? We know from Sherry Twist's pre-bust, post-decoy document that the bracelet was already known to be coming. It's most likely he forgot that he even told her about it. Imagine that. Well, you can go get it in a little bit or something, okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> Are you nervous? A little bit. Does she seem nervous, Lorne? Casey has been confident and in control since he walked in the door. Lorne, on the other hand, is getting more and more nervous by the second. Not that he is being set up, but that his submissive little angel, Kayla Marie, is more alley cat than cuddly kitten. A little bit not as bad as what you thought you would be. Not as bad, but I still am kind of nervous. I'd rather, like, talk a little bit first and then, like, so I'm more comfortable, you know? There's a lot of discussion about this next line. Lorne tries to make a joke or sound hip or something. 
I like to think that he's playing off of one of Kayla's favorite words in the chat log. Cool. Whatever the case, Casey, the decoy portraying Kayla here, rewards him with a very dismissive reply. That's like, cool. Good. I'm really glad. <laughs> <laughs> I like seeing you in person. Yeah, I like seeing you too. Good. So this is getting hot. How come? Oh, Lord. The foreshadowing is hilarious. You are literally in the hot seat and your bot is on the line. Oh, because press the red button. It's like oh. heater too. <laughs> You're going to have a seat too? I actually, I like to sit on the edge of chairs. Do you? Yeah. She's pretty comfortable there. Hi, sir. How are you? All right, how are you doing? What's happening? Not too much. Not too much. At this point, Lauren's world has just completely fallen apart. He doesn't know Chris Hansen from Brian Adams, so in his head, this was either A, her dad, B, the police, or C, Derek, X, Derek. Each of those options were terrifying to him in their own way. You a Boston fan? Well, actually, I don't even watch baseball. Oh, but it's a Boston cap. It's a Boston cap, yeah. yeah. I've always wondered about the baseball hat question because it seems so out of place. Did Chris have a follow-up zinger if Lauren said he was a baseball fan? Maybe a joke about striking out instead of the sure home run he thought he was going to hit? It's a question. I'm going to say that Hanson probably did have a related zinger regarding the Red Sox. They did very well that year. In fact, about a week after Lauren was arrested, they swept the World Series. I looked at the roster of the team from 2007, and I made a joke for Chris that had he only asked back then, I probably could have given him. I imagine Chris saying, Well, you know, if outfielder Wiley Mo Pena married pitcher John Lester, he'd be Wiley Mo Lester. Well, from the looks of this chat, you were hoping to be somewhat of a Wiley Mo Lester. You want to explain yourself? <laughs> this is also a good final look at the Lauren that was. He says, well, It's a Boston cap, yeah and still has a sort of cherubic look on his face. But from now, he begins to really distort. Over time, his eyes get incredibly beady. His entire face starts to shrink, almost like it wants to just disappear in his head. It reminds me of Smeagol in Lord of the Rings and how the ring took its toll over time and transformed him into a monster. It's so great. So what are you up to tonight? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot? No. Well, I tell you, for the last several days, you've been up to a lot. You're a pretty prolific chatter there. When Lorne realizes Chris has his chat log, he lets out a few visible deep breaths and shakes his head. He moves his lips as if he's about to say something in his defense, but nothing comes to mind. We also know this, though. Lorne was likely drunk during much of his chats with Kayla, and as we have seen from countless decoy calls, Lorne probably didn't 100% remember a lot of what he said, which got his mind racing like crazy. What exactly did he say in those chat logs? Chris was about to let him know. You want to explain yourself? Not really. I never really was going to do anything. You weren't really going to do anything? No. So you brought condoms. What else did you bring? I brought her a bracelet. A bracelet. And her, and she is how old? And her, and she is how old? Not the only time we see Chris change his wording because he knows it'll be edited. It's supposed to be 13. It's supposed to be 13. This betrayal felt very real to Lauren. She was supposed to be 13. Not she said she was 13, but she was supposed to be 13. Lorne believed in her. He sounds more hurt by her lies than he is scared of what the outcome of this could possibly be. People talk about how misshapen Lorne's head is. I call it lorp-sided. I think this is an interesting angle because his head is pretty centered, but his ears seem like they're on opposite sides of the equator. And how old are you? 37. 37. You have kids? Today. No, unfortunately. Yeah. Quick tip. When you're caught trying to bang a child and Chris Hansen asks if you have kids, you don't say no, unfortunately. What does that even mean? 
Would he have been molesting them in the comfort of his own home, thus no interference from Chris Hansen? As the great Bapsby pointed out, Lorne had names already chosen for his daughter when he was chatting with Kayla, but he didn't give a fuck about what she wanted to name the boys. If we have a girl, I like the name Cassidy or Hannah, and if we have a boy, I don't know. I only thought about the girls' names, Lowell, because, yeah, we know why. In other words, he was already fantasizing about his little girls he would be having with his little girl. The fact it is Lauren's birthday is one of the greatest things about his tale. Here are other people who share Lauren's birthday. Chuck Berry. Everybody wants to dance. Mike Ditka, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and Zac Efron. But the most interesting has to be Lee Harvey Oswald, as he and Lorne are known to be patsies. In a message posted in the Temple of Teacap, OK Sing to Me points out that both had complicated relationships with their mothers, with an unwavering love for a woman they feel neglected them. I've got nieces, though, nieces. that I think the world of. Yeah, you talk about your nieces in, in, in the chat here. And you talk about how you like to spoil the nieces and how you would like to spoil this 13-year-old girl like you spoil your nieces. Yeah. Lorne foolishly believes these statements are being made in his favor as if to imply his actions are honest. He does not see the clear setup here to call him a creep. I usually don't state this publicly, but I don't really view Lorne as a textbook pedophile. He certainly has exhibited pedophilic behavior and no question intended to bed down young Kayla. But I think he's just a div, with no clear idea on how to deal with females properly. He was in an adult chat room, and Kayla was fair game as far as he was concerned. It could have been an 18-year-old, for example. Lorne could have seen her as young enough to find his impoverished self charming. So in my mind, he is fascinated by pussy. He cannot speak to adult women in real life, obviously. And Kayla showed up at the right time. I also don't buy that he is gay, which I have heard people discuss. I know when people are hiding their true sexuality out of shame, they are sometimes vehemently outspoken against homosexuality. But when Lorne declares and one of the catfish calls that he's not bi and he's not gay, I think it's him being honest. The reason it stands out is because a well-adjusted straight man doesn't feel the need to make that declaration. Is this the way you spoil young women? Well, no. Now what's your name? That was a long pause. Even then, he still doesn't give his name immediately. This is what I was afraid of. You, what were you afraid stupid of? Stupid move. One of the classic Lornisms. Stupid move. What were you afraid of? Just because she was a nice girl. And... She was a nice girl. You still haven't told me your name, though. It's Lorne. Lorne what? Armstrong. Armstrong. And where do you live, Lorne? In Nashville now. Nashville. What do you do in Nashville? Actually, I work at a construction company. And what do you build? Um, I, actually, I just started uh, last week. I'm building right now, building a gym for a church. A gym for a church. Is that a good job? Yeah. Now, besides all this chat here, and we'll go through that in a minute, you also sent a whole bunch of pictures. This is the first time we see actual fear on Lauren's face. And can I say for just a minute that this is Chris Hansen at his absolute best. This was the final episode of TCAP, but you can see how comfortable he is with the questioning and how smooth and controlled he is. He makes it look almost effortless. He is calm, he is direct, and he expertly guides Lauren through his bumbling, fumbling stories. I completely agree about Chris being at the peak of perfection in this, the final TCAP operation. The edited footage shows him well-oiled, but this uncut footage gives the true fanatic the additional look at his mastery. At the same time, his arrogance and cockiness is underscored. That was all great. Until he came after us. No, why would you think that's appropriate? It's not. It's not. Okay, not to pick nits. But for clarity of the lore, I don't believe he sent Kayla any proper photos, and what Chris has showed him is actually a screen capture of Lorne on his webcam. I may be wrong. Those are all your pictures, right? 
Is that all you do in your spare time? No. Yes, Chris. All he did in the weeks leading up to this was obsess about Kayla and karaoke, a pattern that would be continued for years after he got out of prison. Well, minus the karaoke because he legally can't go anymore. You reckon Lorne ever, even one time, was in a karaoke bar focusing on his dream, delusional though it may be, of being discovered while singing? I think karaoke was to Lorne what darts or pool or shuffleboard are to other patrons. Like, I'm going to be here drinking regardless. I may as well karaoke. Hanson just takes his own sweet freaking time with Lorne. It's beautiful. You ever get in trouble like this before? No, I've never done this before. You've never done it before? Have you ever met anybody in person who you first met online in a chat room? No. This is the first time. Another thing that thanks to Tiffany, we now know is a lie. Not only had he chatted with minors in the past, he had exchanged nude pics, been flashed, been in relationships, and drove several hours with his frenemy Tony for an overnight meetup with an underage girl. You could have met up with her and hurt her in the way that you were planning to meet Kayla, Lauren. I don't know. What stopped you? What stopped me? Because she was underage. Well, but you said that you were going to try to be boyfriend and girlfriend with her. Did you already tell her that you loved her and all that stuff? No, not right off the bat. Well, no, not right off the bat, but while you were still talking to her, because you, you were already about 32. Yeah. And she was 15. So I'm wondering if the conversation was pretty much the same as what was happening here. Lorne is not unique in saying it was his first time, as we all know. I can only think of one predator who said no when Chris asked if it was their first time. The unshakable, unbreakable, unmistakable Nick Bailey. That guy didn't follow most of the protocols laid out by the other predators. So you're telling me this is the first time you've chatted online with a 13-year-old girl? No, sir. It's not the first time. I have chatted with a few, and then... As soon as I found their age out and they felt uncomfortable, I stopped talking. So yeah. what made you, all of a sudden, for the first time, get online, chat up a 13-year-old girl, and drive up from Nashville to meet her for sex? Lauren starts muttering here and Hanson isn't having any of it. So delicious. Well, I didn't... Lauren, you send her naked photos. You have an explicit conversation, and you bring condoms. Until Chris Hansen broke down each infraction, Lauren still hadn't quite grasped the magnitude of this event. He knew he couldn't outwit Chris, and is desperately trying to think of his next move. Oh, just look at Lauren's dopey little chimp-like face. He's realizing he's screwed, sure, but you just know this is the pitiable face he has put on throughout his life when facing admonishment. This is the face of a beta cuck male. The definition online of beta male, or simply beta, is a term for men perceived as weak and emasculated. A beta cuck is for men who seek validation and are used to doing feminine activities like arguing with a female. How's that for on the nose? What does that add up to? I know. Lauren has still yet to ask who this guy is or what is going on. Instead, he rubs his face in disbelief. An innocent man would immediately want to know why the hell he was being questioned or immediately storm out of the house. Lauren Armstrong was no innocent man. Again, this is a tactic for someone weak who has never grown into an actual man. It's what we do as children when we are in trouble. I get it. As a child, you want to be in a safe place so you hide your face or rub your face to divert some of your senses and lessen the tension from being put on the spot. Ugh, he's so pathetic. At first, you seem like the good Samaritan. The protector. Don't tell me your last name. Don't ever tell anyone from the internet your last name, okay? Okay, why? Because there are some real weirdos on here sometimes, and they might try to go looking for you. Chris could not have been doing a better job here. 
His emphasis on particular words, dramatic pauses, and disapproving looks are almost enough to make Lorne curl up into the fetal position. He isn't going in for the kill. He has turned a predator into his prey, and he's enjoying every moment. And so am I. I can't help but imagine what Chris could have brought to the next sting had it occurred. I mean, look, he was firing on all cylinders in Bowling Green. It was only going to get better. Hanson vs. Predator was years later, and by then Chris was already showing signs of losing his edge. That said, probably my favorite Hanson zinger comes out of those Hanson vs. Predator episodes. Comment below if you care to guess my favorite Hanson zinger. So don't ever tell them your last name, your address, your phone number, the town you live in, or the school you go to. You're one of those weirdos. This line should have been like a kick in the stomach. There was no debating what Lauren did and how he attempted to manipulate a little girl. I'm not a body language expert, but does Lauren look incredibly relaxed with his legs crossed and still up on the recliner? Was he afraid to move, thinking Chris was a cop, or was he psychologically trying to put himself as far back as possible from the truth right in front of his face? I think Lorne's position is akin to what you see in folks caught in a compromising position. The defensive crossing of the arms, closing themselves off, protecting the body from harm. Only Lorne has to use his legs, as his hands are needed for touching his face repeatedly. I mean, was that some kind of a ruse to gain her trust? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. So how did it go from, hey, be careful, don't give anybody your last name, to, hi, here's some naked pictures of myself and I'm coming over with condoms? I don't know. You don't know? Well, you must know something. I mean, help me to understand this. I don't know what why. What do you mean, don't know? I even did. You don't know why you did it? Well, I think I know why you did it. You did it because you wanted to have sex with a 13-year-old girl. I don't know. I was messed up at the time. I was confused. I didn't want to be there. And my head was all messed up. Are among the most common phrases Lauren uses when confronted about the sting. I know you don't want me to say this again, but I knew I did not want to go to the house. But I still went there. Why did you go there? Because the thought of having sex with an underage girl turned me off. Even Chris gets frustrated about the lack of anything coming out of Lauren's mouth and pushes him to spit something out by deciding for him why he said the things he said. At this point, Lauren could either agree with Chris, disagree and give an alternative reason, or get up and leave the sting house. What choice does Lauren make? I don't think that... No, what, what, what? Again, master trolling from Chris, showing us once again why there was so much excitement around his return. You can really see that Chris has been perfecting his craft and most likely studying interrogation techniques the way he gets Lauren to open up. I don't think that was it. You don't think it was it? Well, why don't you help me out? Why don't you tell me what it was then? And Lauren responds with an answer to a question nobody asked. So I, went, I wasted five years of my life on the internet talking to girls that, I, that gained my trust. And she seemed like somebody I could trust. You could trust. So when you say you, you spent five years on the internet, what, getting taken advantage of by women? In what way? In every way. For instance. Now, two things here. Lorne is both refusing to look Chris directly in the eye, and he's starting to think the story may work based off of Chris Hansen's reaction. You can almost hear the wheels turning in his head as he tries to make the story sound as sad as he possibly can. This Alki's simian mind actually thinks he can garner sympathy from a story about another time when he was a completely clueless moron. Well played, Lauren. Um, I was over in Washington State. I started. That's when I started going on the internet. When you lived in Washington State, you started going on the internet, and what happened? I met a girl. And she said her name was Amanda James, and. She told me that, that her, her daughter was her niece, and that she was watching her niece. Well, she was actually had custody of her niece. And then? Lauren just said the word niece so many times, and now he's licking his lips. Like I said before, not a body language expert, but that seems a little bit off to me. 
I also find it unsettling that the very first infraction he could think of in his previous relationship where he was catfished was that she pretended her daughter was her niece. Chris is desperate to get a coherent story out of this guy, and Lauren is making it near impossible. Oh, I love how fucking dry his mouth is. Um, three, years, uh, three years later, I moved back to Maine just to be close to her because she lived in Pennsylvania. Lauren could barely make it to the next state over. From Maine to Pennsylvania is eight times further than what he traveled to meet Kayla. Even if he fueled up with Tecron, no fumes in the world would have allowed him to coast that last leg of the trip. He would have been panhandling by the time he hit Vermont. Chris looked shocked at how stupid that statement was. He wanted to be closer to her in Pennsylvania, so he moved back to Maine. You can tell he's waiting for the tragic part of the story to happen so he can call it bullshit, but Lauren has taken the long way to get there. I didn't, I didn't date anyone. I didn't see anyone because of her. All right, so what happened? I got back to Maine, and I was talking to her on the phone, and she, uh, my sister wanted to say hi to her. This is the same sister that Lauren would later call a piece of shit and accuse of trying to ruin him. That's what Lauren told you. That fucking bitch is a piece of shit. Why do you want to see that, Mom? Seems strange from a guy who goes on and on about how his sister used to lovingly rub through his hair from mosquito and black fly bites. He used to love it when she'd, she'd give me attention. She'd sit me down and she'd run her fingernails through my hair looking for, for little mosquito bites, black fly bites. So which one is it, Lorne? Does she live so far in the future because her and Ralph have fucked everyone over in the past? You live in the past all the time. You don't uh, know. Yeah. But they live so much in the future. I could live in the past. I could blame your father. I could blame Dale. No, can Lori can't. I don't live in the past. Ralph and Lori can't live in the past because Ralph and Lori abused too many people. Or was she the loving sister picking grubs out of your hair like a fucking orangutan? Yes? No? Maybe so? My sister had been on the internet for a couple of years, and she was able to read people pretty good. There's that dry ass mouth again. Laugh out loud. And what happened? And she got on the phone with her, and she, uh, after she got off the phone, she was only on the phone with her for about two minutes, and she got off the phone with her and told me, uh, told me that. She wasn't real. She wasn't real. This story should have taken 10 seconds to say total, but with all the lip licking and stuttering, it has been strung on for well over a minute. It's hard to tell if Lauren was embellishing the story or not, but what he said was a simple case of being catfished and has zero to do with why he is here to have sex with a 13 year old on his birthday. This story is nothing more than a filibuster, proving Lauren had no backup plan. My excuse to come here, I went to Atlantic City. Most of these guys already had some lie prepared, just in case their teenage hookup turned into a sting of some sort, but Lauren had zero doubt in his head that Kayla would be going home with him tonight. Lauren says he was sexually abused as a child. Isn't it surprising that he didn't try and use this as an excuse when talking to Chris Hansen? It seems right up his alley. His sister sussing out the fraud in a couple of minutes is classic clueless Lauren. She told me she was lying to me and she'd been lying to me all along. Did you ever meet this woman? Did you send her money? I sent her money. I sent her all kinds of Dale Earnhardt things. Dale Earnhardt things. Dale Earnhardt Jr. things. She was Dale. The uh, race car driver. Yeah. I learned from a Jim Camp swim video that people will often touch their face and mouth when they are lying. I just heard Lauren say he gave Amanda James money, but I could have sworn in a call with Ember he claimed he never gave her money, but did in fact send her a lot of memorabilia. Dell Earnhardt Jr. memorabilia. By the way, it's now been seven full minutes since Chris sat down with Lauren, and Lauren still hasn't asked who he is or what kind of trouble he's in. And so because you got taken advantage by a couple of women on the internet, you thought it was okay to take advantage of a 13-year-old girl on the internet? No, I didn't. You didn't? No. I'm very happy that you talked to me before talking to anyone else, though. This way, you'll be safe. That's what I meant, too. I don't know how 
You don't know how what? I don't know how it could lead to this. Well, here, here, let me take you down the road. This is how it went. Ha <laughs> ha, buckle up, Lorne. You started with this, and then it goes to... So this is as thick as a telephone book, by the way, this chat. By 2007, the telephone book was already rapidly declining in popularity before taking a nosedive with the mass proliferation of the smartphone. Depending on where you live in 2019, if you have a phone book at all, it's only between 90 to 210 pages, making Lauren's chat log all that much more impressive in comparison. We have identified the one thing in Lauren's life that can be considered impressive. You started chatting with her when? Last month? So you've been chatting with this woman, this young woman for a month. And so it starts with you being the protective older brother type. Yes, this is one of the most ridiculous parts of the chat log, with Lauren starting out trying to portray a concerned adult. Well, we know how that turned out. And we flip through dozens and dozens of pages here, and ultimately, it builds into a very sexually explicit conversation, right? I wish I were sticking it in you right now. Right here. Even the camera guy is thinking, oh, snap. I'm going to zoom in on him and catch his reaction. That's a pro. You tell her to delete her archives after we stop talking again, okay? Why did you want her to delete her archives? The line, delete your archives. Prior to the MySpace Molly call, this was my only proof that Lauren had done this before. In one call with Winnie, he couldn't even figure out how to delete a picture from the gallery on a basic Android phone. But during the chat with Kayla, he knew the exact steps for her to take to clear the archives to hide their activity. He was a seasoned pro with an unknown number of previous victims. I also found it very Lorne-like that he demanded Kayla delete her archives, but as the great Bapsby pointed out, he was not deleting his. Wait a minute. I just realized Lorne isn't deleting his archives. So Kayla has to delete her archives, but Lorne doesn't have to. And we know why he doesn't delete his archives. He's going back and he's reading that shit. There's only one reason he saves all that. Lauren dug through his archives at one point to prove that Kayla said, K, when he asked her if she wanted him to wear shorts so she could play with him on the way back to his house in Nashville. Oh, there's a sigh, a gentle sigh coming up right here. The hopelessness of Lauren. I'm generally not one to revel in the failures or mistakes of others, but to catch a predator, I feel it was the first time I really permitted myself to relish schadenfreude in my life. This sigh, it's a thing of beauty. Now, opinions differ on this one, but I think Chris clearly has the pages marked of what he is looking for. But you can see here he fans the pages and shuffles the various packets to fully emphasize just how much Lauren has chatted and what Chris already knows. His casual demeanor is a stark contrast to Lauren, who seems to be on the verge of tears. Well, if Chris is doing all that paper shuffling as a clever way to twist the dagger in Lauren's side, bravo, that's brilliant work. I've always seen it as legitimate scanning for which quote to use, as there are so, so many to choose from. Chris would know from experience, too, that Lauren has already outlasted the amount of time most predators stick around. I've always felt that Chris was caught between feeling that he may have a runner any minute and wanting to deliver the perfect chat log quotes. Help me out. I didn't want her to get in trouble. I didn't want her to get in trouble by her parents. At no time was deleting her archives an attempt to keep Kayla Marie out of harm's way. You sneaky gibbon. There's like 10 seconds of silence here. You can practically see smoke coming from Lauren's ears as he futilely tries to get the rusty gears in his head to turn, damn it, turn, to no avail. I mean, this goes on and on and on.
Do you think naughty thoughts about me before you go to sleep? You talk about getting married to her. Getting married, she's 13. Huh? No, when she was 18. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean she was 18? So I meant when she was 18. Well, you were going to marry her when she turned 18. But you're just going to have sex with her from the ages of 13 to, to 18. Now. You're just going to have sex with her until she turns 18. Chris, thank you, Chris. It was such a clean kill that his sword carterized the wound. Lorne never saw that line coming. Are you excited about me or my penis? This hangdog look on his face. Look how much he's changed from the cheerful schoolboy that first bounded up the steps. Watch how beady his eyes are when they open. It's really, it's a marvel of physiology. Did you bring anything else with you tonight? Like what? Like what? What could Lorne have been referring to? The only other thing Lorne had in his truck, from what I understand, was the camera. This leads me to another question. Why did Lorne bring the camera with him? Him and Kayla had already established that they would have to go back to his place because there was nobody to watch but at his shithole apartment in Nashville. Per his chat log, he had plans to memorialize their first time having illegal sex together by taking equally illegal pictures of the statutory rape. Lorne had stated he was trying to pawn the camera to make some extra money, but I don't believe him. He said he drove from pawn shop to pawn shop, but they would not take the camera because the battery cover was missing, so he had tape holding in the batteries, and the pawn shops could not sell or accept it without the cover. Now, look at Lorne for a second. Does he strike you as the kind of guy who doesn't know how a pawn shop works and what their policies are? Probably, but it was his birthday. And it was fate, this meeting with Kayla. Perhaps he thought Cod would step in again to see that he sold his weak-ass, no-battery-cover camera for the princely sum of around two bucks, if he were lucky. Can't blame a drunk simpleton for trying. Like anything? Nope. Food, alcohol? Nope. So just the bracelet and the condoms? Nothing else? What do you think ought to happen to you? Oh, here's a good one. Is Miss Vagina thinking about Mr. Penis? What is she thinking? I love this because it's like an old car sales trick I learned back when I was both the youngest and worst car salesperson in California. I would ask someone how much they thought their trade-in was worth while we were standing next to the vehicle. After they gave me an answer, I would proceed to walk around the car slowly and touch every dent, ding, scratch, and imperfection I could find in front of them. I would then repeat the original number to the customer wanted for their trade-in, but this time with a skeptical tone. In almost every case, whatever amount the customer asked for originally would now be lower now that I pointed out the ugly truth about their vehicle. Chris does the same thing here. He asked Lauren what should happen to him right before dropping this ridiculous and embarrassing Mr. Penis line on him. He then neatly stacks the paper on his lap before putting his fingers into a thinking man pose and asking the question again about what should happen to him. Go ahead, Chris. Drop the mic. You earned this one. Up until now, we've seen Lauren in various states of discomfort, but notice when Lauren moves his hand here, we get to see the true look of despair for the first time. Oh, God. What's up with that? What do you think ought to happen to you? Help me out. I think I should go to counseling to get off the internet. You should go to counseling and get off the internet. Did you ever say to yourself, hey man, I got a problem here? No, because I never thought I did. You never thought you did? This is the most honest thing Lorne said in the entire confrontation with Chris. At the time it was written off as an attempt to avoid trouble, which it was, 
but with his recent admission of previous illegal relationships, Lorne had all the markings of a dangerous predator. He really didn't think there was anything wrong with a man in his 30s dating several underage girls and potentially engaging in sexual activity. I loved her first, I held her first, and a place in my heart will always be hers. If he was a more intelligent person, I shudder to think just how prolific he could have been. He is a million dollar manipulator with a 10 cent intellect and non-sufficient common sense. He's a motorcycle guy in a moped band. Does this incident make you think that perhaps you have a problem? Fucking mad at myself for doing that. When did you start getting mad at yourself? When Chris Hansen walked out. Okay. What I thought was, was it either her father or a cop. So you were mad at yourself for getting caught? I was mad at myself for getting caught. What are you going to do about it? I can do something that I can't do that. Oh my god. This right here. I heard Zoe Mob refer to this as the eye of Lorne. That confused, lonely eye peeking out, wishing to see something familiar that might explain this away as a bad joke or a bad dream. It is a haunting image in a cautionary tale. The eye of Lorne. <laughs> well, do you ever watch uh, television much? I'm not even sure Lorne had a TV in Nashville, but if he did, he didn't spend a lot of time watching it because most of his time was spent showing off his dick on his can. Uh, actually, alternate reality Lorne has a TV in the Lorne Diaries. You ever watch a program called Dateline NBC? Well, there's something I gotta tell you. Chris stands up here and keeps direct eye contact with Lorne. He is now towering over him while he circles behind the recliner, just in case Lorne decides to get froggy as he slowly drops the Dateline NBC bomb one line at a time. He might as well have pulled his dick out and urinated all over Lorne at the same time. This was the lowest of Lorne's many lows up until this point in his life. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC and we're doing a story on our oh. ah, ah, He said it! He said it! Now you're free to walk out of this house right now. But if there's anything else you want to say, now would be the time to say it. Oh, you know Lorne Stank would have been all over that chair. There's a discussion in the temple regarding Lorne's presumptive odor. Of those who think he was too broke to buy stuff like soap or shampoo, the best of the descriptions says Lorne probably smelled like sour milk and casino carpet with notes of chicory and shame. You know what Hanson looks like here? He looks like your friend's father the day after you slept over. You know how he'd drop you off at home, but wait to make sure that you were able to get in the house. Sheriff's office, down! Get down! On the ground, on the ground! While Lorne is getting screamed at by the police, Chris calmly collects the dick pics from Lorne's recliner, probably to get ready for the next predator to show up. Total fucking pro. <laughs> Lorne definitely did not expect the police at this point. Those tears he was shedding were for two reasons. First, he truly believed he was in love with Kayla and she would one day be his bride. She agreed with everything he said, thought he was a great singer, and didn't demand he put his penis away. She was the next best thing to his mom as far as he was concerned. Second, and maybe even more crushing to him, he knew that this would mean no country music career for him. Even if Lauren had the talent, drive, connections, and luck to make it in country music, being exposed as a child predator on national television were going to end that dream. Running from his problems in Maine was supposed to be a brand new start in Nashville, and I'm sure he vowed to do better, but just months after arriving, his life had taken a terrible turn for the worst. Now, if this had all been what Lorne thought was true, and things had, quote, gone as planned, 
This dull-minded dingleberry would have ended up on the lam with a huge manhunt underway. The FBI would have examined all the conversations on Kayla's computer and be honing in on Nashville within the first 24 hours. I shudder to think how this wussy would have rid himself of his blonde liability once he'd gotten what he wanted and he felt the heat from news reports or questions from his neighbors. Thankfully, it was our shared reality. It was a sting designed to catch Lorne as he attempted to do something dastardly. You know, there's one more thing I want to address about my take on Lorne and the Lornography. When I first heard about the Church of Cod, I was hooked, because it's truly my kind of humor. The idea that Lorne could be viewed as a savior, sacrificed on Kayla's front steps, so that we would always have him to look to as the stupidest motherfucker alive. That no matter the mistakes we make, no matter how low we may find ourselves, we can find peace in knowing we will never be as stupid as Lorne. It is comforting, and it is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. Bravo, early Lornographers. You win the internet as far as I'm concerned. I wonder how Chris Hansen truly feels about his interview with Lorne. With a chat log that thick, the dick pics, walking around naked with his baseball hat on, silly nicknames and pure desperation, Chris was probably expecting a much more, dare I say, entertaining interview than the one he got. Little did he realize that his absolute shellacking of Lorne, complete with the mocking minisyllables and quotable one-liners, would one day bring people together from all over the world. Lorne was not the most memorable predator to me when TCAP first aired, and even during countless rewatches in the years that followed, Lorne never stuck out as anything other than another weirdo getting bested by Chris Hansen. It wasn't until I discovered TCAP on YouTube and the work that so many had put in keeping TCAP alive long after it would have been a footnote in the forgotten TV landscape that I was able to truly understand the magic of Lauren Armstrong. If you would have told me three years ago that one day I would spend hours of my workday listening to the phone calls between an attempted child diddler and a cast of catfish, I would have had two words for you. Oh, really? But yet here we are. To those of you out there who have spent months and years dealing with this man-child in the name of hours of content, thank you for making this a reality. Lastly, Tiffany, Debbie, getting Lauren to admit this after well over a decade of denial deserves nothing less than a standing ovation. I think you should say it yourself. I was a predator. No sense me not saying it because... Everything I did says that I was. That's exactly it. I'm the winner! This only solidifies how important a show like To Catch a Predator was and what it helped to accomplish. It wasn't about IRL streamers, internet drama, or Egyptian porn stars. It was about highlighting the dangers lurking behind computer and phone screens waiting to make your child the next victim. As many of you know, Lorne is back in prison. Community member Arodo has been kind enough to provide us with the address if you'd like to send some correspondence to Lorne in jail. Crazy Chemist has gone through the trouble of getting us the rules for sending Lorne mail. You can use a P.O. box as a return. No stickers, markers, or scents allowed on the packaging or they will reject it. You should limit photos to three 4x6 photos. Those can be sent from any address. You can send a standard postcard as well. Crazy Chemist also adds, Pick your personal trolling method and have fun. Here are a few ideas for anyone wanting to trigger Lorny. Send a photoshopped image of anyone making money off his image or book, such as total sales of book, and a deposit in a bank account. Create a Reddit post on the Fans of Hanson vs. Predator page, saying you are creating a movie about him along with a 30-second preview clip made from To Catch a Predator. He Googles his name, and since that will be current, it will definitely be near the search top. For some reason, he thinks there are a group of people making money off his name, and it eats at his thoughts more than anything else. Thank you for that information, Crazy Chemist. Well, that's it for this evening. From all of us here at Bakeline, good night. Doesn't matter.
matter what comes, friends feel better in life with mental fresh and full of life. Nothing gets to you, staying fresh, staying cool with mental fresh and full of life. Fresh goes better. Mentos.